1949, the Soviet Union tested their first ever atomic bomb. Their actions shocked the world. Even after their grand alliance in 1941, both sides had been secretly racing for possession of the world's deadliest weapon. Мы, советские люди, не связываем своих расчетов на будущее с использованием атомных бомб. America won the race with the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in World War II, but the Soviets had caught up four years earlier than they predicted. This was the beginning of the Cold War. When Joe Stalin finally uh, explodes uh, Joe I uh, in 1949, all bets are off. This changes everything. Whoever had the bomb at the end of the war would have been in a position to police the world. But how had the Russians made this giant leap in technology in such a short space of time? A network of spies embedded within America and Britain's secret atomic program had been stealing research secrets and sending them back to Moscow. With one woman at the center of it all, Sonia, one of the Red Army's best and most highly trained illegal wireless operators. Now, for the first time, declassified security service files reveal just how much they actually knew about Sonia, how she was watched, interrogated, even bugged, and how her actions set off a chain reaction that would take the West into the Cold War, with America and Britain's atomic relationship at an all-time low. The British have to tell the Americans that they have a problem. The damage is, is massive. My mother was a radical. Was she a traitor? This is the story of the spy who stole the atom bomb. In the year 2000, the Russian government posthumously awarded a Medal of Honor to Ursula Burton for her achievements in spying for the former USSR. The gesture recognized that this woman, born Ursula Kuczynski in Berlin in 1917, had played a critical part in Russia's convoluted history. Born into a wealthy Jewish family, she had risen through the ranks to become one of the Soviet Union's most successful spies. Her greatest achievement? Handing over Britain and America's secret plans for the atomic bomb. But Sonia, as she was codenamed, kept her life of espionage secret for over 30 years. Her children didn't even find out about her illustrious past until they were middle-aged and she took many of her secrets to her grave. Now for the first time, with the release of files from security sources across Europe, intelligence experts, historians, and her descendants are working together to uncover the incredible story of Sonia, how she managed to evade capture, and how her actions could have changed the course of history. Berlin, Germany, 1921. Ursula Kuczynski lives with her parents and siblings in a large lakeside villa in the suburb of Schlattensee. As a Jewish family in Germany, her parents had embraced the communist ideology taking root in Western Europe following the Russian Revolution, particularly in the face of growing fascism at home. The whole family are ideologically driven, and they are driven to help, you know, a a foreign power, if you like, which is Russia. My mother then, from a youthful on, became a communist. Whenever I asked her later on, or anybody asked her, when did you become a communist, she could only say, well, I was born with it. A bright and intellectual teenager, Ursula joins the communist youth movement at the age of 17 and makes the most of the heady days and nights of 1920s Berlin. She was a, something of an intellectual, and she also read the you know, US publications by Lenin. And she became a very disciplined member, I believe, of the youth group where she was in. Following World War I, however, the new Russia that Sonia idolized, which was now ruled by Lenin's Bolsheviks, had begun to raise suspicion, both in Germany and internationally. 
Starting even as, as, as early as World War I, the Bolsheviks were not, uh, were not trusted agents. Uh, they would break their word. They weren't on the same team. Sonia's work with the communist youth offered plenty of social opportunities, and it's here that she meets her future husband, Rolf Hamburger. Marriage to Rolf at age 20 swiftly takes her from Berlin halfway around the world as Rolf takes a job as an architect in Shanghai. However, in 1930, Shanghai was a dangerous place to be a communist. In the immediate aftermath of World War I, Shanghai was one of the most exciting, and for many Europeans, advanced cities in the world. In other words, Shanghai was seen as a place of modernity, of glamour, and also a little bit of a whiff of danger. The expression to be shanghai exists even in English today, and it has that sense of maybe something dark around every corner that might catch you unawares if you don't look out for yourself. Following a period of bloody slaughter by the ruling government, Many surviving communists had moved out to remote parts of the countryside where they were regrouping and retraining their army. And having been an active party member in Germany, Ursula was keen to help in any way she could. She made contact with a left-leaning American journalist and writer, Agnes Smedley, who she knew was currently working in Shanghai. Ursula and Agnes became close friends, and Agnes inducted her into the European colonial social scene. Moving within elite circles meant that people like Ursula and Agnes could avoid suspicion. It was through this world that Agnes introduced Ursula to Richard Sorger, a Soviet military intelligence officer. Richard Sorger was a German who appeared to be a journalist, and certainly that was the guise that he gave to the outside world. In fact, he was working as an agent for the Soviet Union and turned out to be one of the most effective and in some ways influential spies of that era. Having heard of her willingness to support her Chinese comrades in their work, Sorger asked Ursula to provide her apartment as a secret rendezvous for his meetings with politicians, businessmen and comrades. By hosting the meetings, Ursula gained her first experience of the world of espionage. And looking after secret documents and weapons for Sorga, who was sending intelligence to the Soviets on the actions of the Japanese, increased her determination to give her life to the Soviet cause. Then suddenly, Ursula found that she was pregnant. In 1930, she gave birth to a son, Michael, but she was determined to keep working for Sorga. By 1934, Richard Sorger was hugely impressed by her dedication to the cause and gave her the opportunity to play a much bigger role. She was invited to move to Moscow and trained to become an illegal wireless operator. Despite her commitment, the decision became the first of many difficult choices. She would have to leave her four-year-old son behind. Living in Moscow, Michael would have learned to speak Russian and could potentially blow her cover in the future. But there was a solution. Sie ist also auch da immer auf Hilfe angewiesen. Und es gibt ja ein, ein Kindermädchen, äh, was, äh, die schon länger in der Familie Kuczynski äh, als Kindermädchen äh, agiert. Und bei der kann sie zum Teil oder bei anderen Verwandten die Kinder immer lassen, wenn sie für diese äh, Ausbildung äh, nach Moskau muss. With Michael safely with his nanny and parents-in-law in Czechoslovakia, Ursula took up Sorga's offer. She left China, her husband and her son behind. Conscientious and a fast learner, she quickly acquired all the skills she needed to carry out secret work for the communists. Sie ist also nicht nur im Funken ausgebildet worden, sondern zum Beispiel auch äh, in Sprengstoff. Äh, Handhabung. She was given a code name, Sonja. Meanwhile, in Germany, Hitler's Nazi Party were now in power and in September 1935 passed the Nuremberg Laws defining German citizenship, which excluded Jews. Sonia's family were now in danger and were making plans to escape to London. My grandpa, in fact, was well known as a political figure 
And so the very day the Nazis rose to power, he legally left Germany in a car to Czechoslovakia, and from there he moved to England. Sonia was in no less danger in the Japanese-occupied Manchuria, and as her situation became increasingly precarious, her Soviet controllers took her out of China, with postings first in Poland and then in Switzerland. It was here that Sonia was to be instrumental in setting up one of Europe's most notorious spy rings, the Red Orchestra. The Red Orchestra was a select group of agents working in neutral Switzerland. They spied on Nazi activities in occupied Europe. Und dann beginnt eine Aktivität während des Krieges bis Ende 43, die wahrscheinlich mit zu den erfolgreichsten äh, sowjetischen äh, Residenturen des militärischen Nachrichtendienstes zählt. Und in dieser Residentur oder in dieser Konstruktion hat Sonja die Aufgabe, Funker auszubilden. Sonja became a handler and courier for her trainees in the field, collecting intelligence on Nazi activities. Meanwhile, in London, England, her family were forming their own spy network, her brother Jürgen moving in increasingly elite circles, and her sister working to find Sonja new recruits in England. In 1949, her sister recruited Alexander Foote and Len Burton, both veterans of the Spanish Civil War, and sent them to Switzerland to meet Sonia. He's given the most elaborate um, identification signals in order to, to, um, uh, to meet up with um, Sonia. Something like, you know, carry a green bag in one hand and an orange in another hand, and um, Sonia will turn up with a, a rolled up newspaper as well as, uh, you know, an, um, an unfurled um, umbrella. It's this sort of um, quite bizarre identification process that, um, that they employ. So the system of recruiting Soviet spies uh, was really the, the true cloak and dagger kind of uh, thing that you read about in books. The aim was for these agents to pass back to their handlers um, any information that they could, and their handlers would then get this information back to Moscow for analysis. Die zwei Engländer, sie sind in München mehrfach und haben äh, offensichtlich die Aufgabe, äh, Dinge auszukundschaften, wo man eventuell äh, große, wirkungsvolle Sprengstoffattentate oder äh, Sabotageaktionen mit Sprengstoff äh, verüben könnte. Und sie sind zufällig in einer bayerischen äh, Gaststube, Und der Wirt sagt ihnen, sie möchten ihre Zigaretten ausmachen, denn in zwei Minuten kommt der Führer. Und zwei Meter von ihnen geht Adolf Hitler vorbei in einen Nebenraum. Und beide schreiben unabhängig in ihren Reports, äh, wenn sie eine Pistole dabei gehabt hätten, hätten sie nicht gezögert zu schießen. Life for Sonia consisted of bringing up her children by day and radio contact with Moscow headquarters, known to her as Center by night. But in 1939, war broke out in Europe and Sonia was forced once again to make a difficult choice. With Nazis at the Swiss borders, she and her agents' lives were once again at risk. Moving back to Berlin was out of the question, the only option to move to Britain where her family had fled. But unbeknownst to the Red Orchestra, British MI5 were compiling a dossier of evidence on the group. And for the first time, Sonia was being watched. In the late 1930s, Germany was leading Europe into another war. Since the First World War, both they and their enemies had realized the advantages that could be gained through espionage. In 1909, the British Committee for Imperial Defense set up the Secret Service Bureau as a response to not only some uh, sensational journalism about the German threat, but an actual German threat. America was not um, particularly interested in intelligence. Uh, America's use of, of intelligence was uh, basically wartime only. 
World War II really was the catalyst that changes absolutely everything um, in a transatlantic uh, sense, both on the US side and on the British side. For a long time, the focus of intelligence for Britain had been on Soviet Russia. I think in Britain, ever since the Russian Revolution in 1917, there had been great concern and angst about what the Russians were really up to. But the new threat of war had made America and Britain turn its attentions elsewhere, and in the Nazis, both countries had a common intelligence enemy. The forerunner of the CIA, the Office of Strategic Services, was born. Britain's intelligence services were more concerned about uh, the fascist threat than they were the Soviet threat, even though at the time, the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany were allies. In terms of a declaration of war, uh, the Brits were holding out uh, uh, basically by themselves for two years. Um, in, uh, the Americans knew that, that war was coming and that they were going to be involved, and there were various fact-finding uh, trips that the Americans uh, dispatched, uh, certain people, the most famous of whom is, uh, was, was General um, Wild Bill Donovan. He shows up and becomes uh, fast friends uh, with the, the British intelligence community, and so he opens the door for a symbiotic relationship. In June 1941, however, the Nazis invaded the Soviet Union and dissolved a non-aggression pact between the two countries. Soviet Russia was now an ally of Britain, and the British Foreign Office put a ban on intelligence gathering on their new allies. The Foreign Office at the time was the one who said, we can't do this for diplomatic reasons, and they said that allies don't spy on allies. And we now know, looking at the MI5 records, that MI5 said, come on, You've got to be kidding. Soon after the invasion of the Soviet Union and when Britain and, and Soviet Union became allies, MI5 set up their own department dealing with what they called subversive activities. And what that really meant was communism. MI5 had started a file on Sonia's Red Orchestra. The contents of these files have only just been declassified. What is particularly striking, though, is actually how little information they needed in order to open a file on someone. And uh, indeed, you see that it's just a, a, a few traces of information coming into them that meant that they opened a file on, on this woman. Through their surveillance on the Red Orchestra, MI5 decided that Sonia's involvement was large enough to open individual files on both her and her agent, Len Burton. Len Burton had been known to MI5 for a while as a communist sympathizer, having traveled to Spain to fight on the side of the communists in their civil war. His relationship to Sonia made her, in British eyes, more interesting. And this relationship was about to get a lot closer. She receives instructions from Moscow that she is to go to Britain. And to divorce uh, Rudolf Hambo, to divorce her husband and to marry Alexander Foote, in order to gain a British passport. Sonia and Rolf had been living apart since her training in Moscow and had become estranged from each other. But he made one last trip to Switzerland to see his family, finalize the divorce, and say goodbye for the last time. The good of the party was the essential thing. And if that meant that he stays and does his work for the good of the party in one country, she goes to another country, that's, that's not even that much of a sacrifice. I think she's, she's okay about that. And my mother was a very practical woman, you know. She, otherwise she couldn't have done the kind of work she did. She was very pragmatic, you know, and if necessary, she would have grabbed the next guy coming along if it would have suited her or so. The plan was set for Sonia's wedding to foot, but at the last minute he changed his mind and suggested she marry Len instead. His decision was to affect the course of both their lives. Alexander Foot gesteht ihr, also er ist eigentlich nur nach Spanien gegangen, weil er einer Frau eine Frau geschwängert hat und ihr die Ehe versprochen hat und dann ist er geflüchtet und deswegen kann er Nicht noch mal heiraten und besonders will er nicht zurückgehen. And seven years after their marriage, Foot was to defect to the West. Es gibt Theorien, die sagen, dass er von Anfang an für MI6 gearbeitet habe und einer der erfolgreichen Infiltrationsversuche war. My father was full under her spell, right from the beginning. And completely in love with her, but he was far too shy 
to shy to tell her or to let her even know. I don't know whether he knew how to go about such things. And I guess my mother was probably ignorant for some time. Wie das Leben oft solche Wunder bereithält, wird eine große Liebe, die bis ans Lebensende von beiden hält. Once again, Sonia was on the move. With two children in tow and a new country ahead of them, they left Switzerland in December of 1939. This is a, um, a memo written by a wartime MI5 officer in 1940 when, when she was trying to gain ent entry into Britain. And um, it's quite clear that although they didn't have any uh, substantial evidence against her, they were very suspicious of her. And they placed her on what was known as the Black uh, Watch List, which meant that essentially if she tried to leave Britain, um, all sorts of alarm bells would ring at the port authorities and then also in MI5 headquarters in, in Whitehall. Her new home was to be in Oxford, and Sonia would spend the next 10 years of her life in the area. From this new base, Sonia was placed at the heart of a spy ring, intent on monitoring the new atomic weapons project. The way that the Russian scientists first learned that this was being developed as a military weapon was very simple. For six months, the leading scientific journals contained no new articles about atomic science. And this total absence of any information led the Soviet scientists to correctly to assume that this had become a classified subject. America and Britain quickly decided that a joint effort would be needed to win a race for a bomb against the Nazis. The British knew that they couldn't develop everything at the same time. They, they sort of had to harness the power of the American economy, the American population, um, the American universities, American know-how, um, and frankly, the space in America to test things that need uh, a giant amount of space to, to experiment with. As an agent handler, Sonia would need to find people embedded within the Allied Atomic Project who would be willing to pass over or get access to crucial information that would help the Soviets to pursue their own race for the atomic bomb. And for that, she turned to her family once again. Her brother, Jürgen, who had by now become the leader of the German Communist Party in England, had been approached by a shy German scientist working in the British part of the atomic program. His name was Klaus Fuchs. Klaus Fuchs was one of the biggest atom spies. He had an encyclopedic memory. He fled Nazi Germany in the early 1930s, and he sought communism really as the, as the means of escaping Nazism. Equally as motivating for him was the fact that this would stop the Americans having a monopoly of the atomic weapon. So in his mind, and in the minds of many others, actually the, the way to secure world peace was to ensure that each side had these weapons, a, a, a form of deterrence in a sense. Sonia's brother, Jürgen, put Fuchs in contact with Sonia and set up a meeting for them both. Sonia's interaction with this agent was unusual for one reason. They met in person. And she would travel to Banbury by train, and I, th I believe she cycled to the station, again cycled to a country lane where she had arranged to, to meet Fuchs uh, in more or less in isolation, and, and they would then exchange information then. Sonia would continue to meet Fuchs in the countryside for two years. In running him and other spies such as Melita Norwood, Alan Nunmay, and Bruno Pontecorvo, Sonia was handling some of the most classified and high-grade atomic research in existence. The way that the Soviet agents would, tr would transmit their information back to Moscow, well, really, there's no one way that, that, this, that this was done. And this is what made it so difficult for Britain's intelligence services and American intelligence services to spot it. It could happen with secret inks. It could happen uh, with literally documents smuggled into, an, into a briefcase and transported. It could happen with um, carrier pigeons. Uh, you name it, uh, there was no end to the realm of possibilities of how this information could be transmitted. In getting her information back to Moscow, Sonia would meet representatives attached to the Russian embassy in London, or use Morse code to transmit shorter messages back to the Soviet control she erected a large aerial in the numerous houses she occupied around Oxford. She also had to build her own transmitter from scratch. 
And of course, it's interesting that she had a big wireless sticking up from this flat that a uh, special branch and MI5 commented upon, but nobody uh, went round there to actually look into a cupboard. By broadcasting on the airwaves in Britain, Sonia was leaving herself wide open to detection by signals intelligence at the government's secret code-breaking centre at Bletchley Park. When war was declared in December 39, all amateur radio transmissions were closed down in this country. So therefore it meant that anyone in fact who was transmitted had to be clandestine. And Bletchley Park in fact became the site for decrypting these enemy agents' messages. Transmitting to Moscow made her even more recognisable. The Germans use the sort of international Morse code that we use now. But the Russians, of course, because they're a different alphabet, use what we call the Cyrillic code on there, where they would, their characters, they'd have to put special uh, combinations of dots and dashes in, you see, on there. You knew it was coming from a Russian station. And the fact that by 1941, the Soviets were now allies didn't completely exclude them from surveillance. The allies took steps to listen in on their communications. In the US, this project was named Venona. The US and, and the Brits, through various listening stations internationally, start to, uh, to collect um, data. They, they collect um, Soviet signals, diplomatic signals, military signals, but they can't actually crack into it. Bletchley Park had shut down their work on breaking the Soviet cipher, but it was still possible to pinpoint exactly where a signal was coming from. Every transmission originates from somewhere and if you get the proper type of aerial, you actually focus on that and say, that's where the loudest signal's coming from. It's a brief way of telling you on there. Therefore, it's somewhere along that bearing. If you get two DF stations, one there and one there, and they both go on it, that's what they call a fix. So you've got a good idea of where it is. If you get a third station, one, two, and one underneath it, you get a triangle, and you've got them. All the more intriguing as to why someone didn't pick up on Sonia's nighttime communications. And in 1943, somehow, Sonia received a copy of a political treaty so sensitive that the details were only known by President Theodore Roosevelt, Winston Churchill, and a handful of chiefs of staff and military leaders. It was known as the Quebec Agreement, and it concerned the growing atomic weapons program. It was a sort of informal patchwork of treaties and, and personal agreements and people calling each other on the phones and writing letters. And so it's decided that this all needs to come under a formal umbrella. The Quebec Agreement does that. What it says not only is that they're going to cooperate on the development, but they're also going to consult each other on the use. And they don't really know what this looks like. They don't know what a nuclear weapon looks like. It's not even tested until 1945 but they know that it's going to be a game changer. And crucially, the agreement also stated that Joseph Stalin and the Soviet regime would be kept out of this collaboration. By passing this information directly to Moscow, Sonia had confirmed to Stalin exactly what he'd feared about allying himself with the West. One of his great paranoias is that he was going to be caught out and the Brits and the Americans were going to do something without him. And so when something like the Quebec Agreement would come across his desk, this is just another, uh, another nail in the coffin. And as he reads it, it reinforces his personal narrative that he's not one of the big three. If she'd been un unsuccessful in those activities, I think it's reasonable to say that the Cold War would have developed in a very different way. The Soviet Union wouldn't have had that input from her and arguably would have developed the atomic bomb later than it did. With a probable Allied victory in sight on the ground and a growing mistrust between Russia and the West, the need to resume intelligence gathering on the Soviets was ever more important. America's efforts to crack the Soviet code were to start a chain of events that would jeopardize Sonia's whole operation and also threaten their special relationship with Britain. In 1945, the war was over, and Sonia enthusiastically celebrated along with her neighbors in Oxford. But her work did not stop. MI5 were now using every technique available to keep tabs on Sonia's activities. So the usual mechanism for um, 
intercepting uh, someone's telephone and, and postal communications was a home office warrant. And this was um, not an easy thing to get. You had to have fairly um, substantial evidence for the minister, the home office minister, to sign off on one. There weren't too many of these things in operation, even during the war. Um, so this isn't something that was just sort of um, passed out lightly. And indeed, we see this um, in the case of Ursula Burton, that they were monitoring her, her mail at periodic times during the war. And then there was also liaison with local police and surveillance to see what she was doing. What's extraordinary is looking at the new files that have been released on Sonia is actually how close they came to detecting her, although they didn't at the time know it. But in her training, Sonia had learned how to be discreet, even in communications to her family, many of which contained coded phrases that would look innocent if intercepted. Uh, in case of the, of the atomic uh, bombs by Melita Norwood, she would pick up the phone and she would hear three sharp blows down the, the receiver. She'd pick it up and you'd get the which was the, the uh, signal that there was to be uh, a drop. Her particular drop was in a railway station between two bricks. Then, inexplicably, Sonia stopped receiving messages from Moscow. There was no one on the airwaves and, importantly, no cheques coming in as payment. Now living in a small village in Oxfordshire, Sonia and her family were cut off, and life was about to get more difficult. Alexander Foote, who Sonia had recruited in Switzerland, defected from his Russian control in Berlin and escaped to the British sector. He brought with him names of his comrades and denounced Sonia and Len. MI5 now had enough evidence to interrogate them and assigned their best man to the job. William Jim Scarden is an extraordinary character. He is, was MI5's ace spy catcher, uh, master interrogator. His manner of uh, interrogating is, uh, has some quite remarkable contemporary overtones. He found that the most useful way to interrogate someone was to befriend them and to actually very, very gradually just talk to them and say, look, I know you've done it. You know you've done it. Wouldn't it feel much better if you just confessed? In September 1947, Jim Scarden went to Sonia's countryside home along with a colleague and a police detective from the Oxfordshire Police. An account of the entire event is recorded on Sonia's MI5 file. For me, this is the, the most interesting record in all of the MI5 Sonia files. It's the, uh, the note of the interrogation um, written by Jim Scarden after his interrogation of her at her home uh, near Oxford. It shows the lengths that he went to to try to get some intelligence out of her. They were written at a time um, when no one thought they'd ever be released. So you, um, you find some spectacularly un-PC comments written about uh, people. The door was answered by Mrs. Burton, who is a somewhat unimpressive type with frowsy, unkempt black hair, perceptively greying and a rather untidy appearance. I went straight into the tack and told Mrs. Burton, we had a vast amount of information in our possession and we required cooperation to help us clear up ambiguities and to resolve the position of her family at the present time. He has a really a spectacularly good ability to be able to summarize people in a few sentences and you really get a vivid impression of them um, from, his, from his notes on people. Scarden's notes even seem to show a level of admiration for Sonia's steely resolve under interrogation. By the stand she took, she tacitly admitted that she had worked for Soviet intelligence. The manner in which she did so was a credit to her earlier training for every possible piece of cajolery, artifice, and guile that could be was employed without any success whatsoever. But the MI5 men wouldn't have been able to arrest Sonia even if she had confessed. MI5 and SIS have never and probably will never have the power of arrest. In other words, they were only advisory services. There's quite an important reason behind this. It was from MI5 and MI6's earliest establishment in 1909. It was felt by Whitehall, particularly the War Office, that if an intelligence service was given the power of arrest, it would quickly become a secret police. And Sonia would have known that the only proof that would suffice was a confession. 
The only way that they could have got her was through a confession, which is what makes it all the more striking that MI5's ace confession gatherer, ace interrogator, Jim Scarden, couldn't get a confession from Ursula Burton. If anyone probably in the world could, it would have been him, and he wasn't able to do it. Sonia's unwillingness to cooperate was setting her apart from many of her comrades in the espionage world. Since the end of the war, some Soviet agents had started to defect. In 1945, a spy embedded in the Soviet embassy in Canada named Igor Goshenko defected, bringing with him 109 documents on Soviet espionage activities in the West, including Stalin's efforts to steal nuclear secrets. For the first time, the West was realizing just how far the Soviets had penetrated. Guzenko basically uh, blows open the, the scope of atomic espionage. Almost at every stage, um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the whole project was penetrated uh, by, by the, the, the Soviet services. But for Sonia and her agents, the worst was still to come. America's Venona project had finally cracked the Soviet code. Uh, the Soviets are using an encryption method called a one-time pad. And a one-time pad is a, is a basically completely gener a, a, a randomly generated bit of, of numbers on, on one, one side and then a corollary on the other. And as long as you don't use a one-time pad twice, you basically have a theoretically um, secure system. For whatever reason, uh, a Soviet code clerk uses a one-time pad twice. And that basically breaks open uh, years of back traffic of, um, of, of Soviet, uh, Soviet communications. Klaus Fuchs had since been transferred to the United States, aided by Sonia, to work on the US side of the program, called the Manhattan Project. This, however, put him under the full scrutiny of Venona. In the late 1940s, it had become clear that actually uh, Klaus Fuchs was one of the atom spies, and the agencies were very quick to narrow down on him. The difficulty was, how could you prove that in a court of law? The Venona program was an enormous secret that couldn't be publicly revealed, and so it was important to find other information. And the only other information, really, was to get Fuchs to confess. Now living back in Britain, Fuchs was brought in for questioning by Jim Scarden. They used the excuse that his father was applying for a visa to visit him. We know that by late 1949, just prior to his arrest, Fuchs was going through something of a crisis of confidence. We know from the MI5 files that have since been released that he was having an affair with one of his colleagues' wives. We know that he was finding it tremendously difficult to keep the two parts of his brain, the, the nationalist British scientist and the Soviet agent, separate. He, the, the two were blurring much more. The news that Britain had produced Soviet spies was now public knowledge, and the Americans were demanding some serious answers from their intelligence partners. In the United States, Congress issued a booklet called Soviet Atomic Espionage, which essentially pointed the finger at Britain and its lack, lapse in, in security, its lack of a serious uh, effort to monitor what was going on. The American and British atomic programs also had distinct cultural differences when it came to security on the project. The clearances operated in a very different way to the manner in which they operate today. There, there was no such thing as positive or developed vetting. Names were simply run against lists of Soviet agents or German agents, and if your name did not appear on that list, essentially you were thought to be okay. We know that Klaus Fuchs's name was rushed through that, that, those efforts because there was a desperate need for good scientists, and he clearly was a good scientist. One of the legendary CIA officers, a guy named Bill Harvey, says, uh, this is why we should never trust the British. And so uh, it, it does create a, a, real, a real rift, um, because the Americans uh, want to work with the Brits in certain circumstances, but at the same time, they can't tolerate uh, counterintelligence failures of this magnitude. And Venona sort of shows that the Americans, not only that they can stand on their feet, but also that, uh, that, that they, they have apparently fewer counterintelligence problems uh, than, their, than their British partners. The special relationship between Britain and America ground to an all-time low. The impact of the different um, spy scandals um, had on the relationship was um, systemic. It was seismic. Put simply, uh, America didn't trust its ally Britain.
With the spy scandals all over the newspapers, Sonia was aware that her time was running out. When the case, the Fuchs case became known, that settled things in a new way for my parents. And uh, there was, I guess, a certain pressure for them to leave Britain. Then, in January of 1950, Klaus Fuchs finally confessed to being a Soviet spy. But to what extent would he betray his fellow comrades? Sonia and her family knew that they had to leave Britain. I remember us packing up all the suitcases, big sea bags, sort of bound onto the cars outside somewhere, and then a full load going to London, spending the night in London, and then we left for Germany. My mother told us two kids that we're going on a visit to Germany, but she knew, of course, it would be for good which he hadn't told us at the time. Sonia left England just two days after Fuchs was arrested as a result of his confession. I think this was almost like a, a priest's confession. He could finally get this great secret off his chest which had been weighing him down for the best part of a decade. Fuchs was shown a picture of Sonia and admitted that he'd had clandestine meetings with her in Banbury, where he'd given her highly sensitive material. His trial in March 1950 lasted just 90 minutes, and he was sentenced to 14 years' imprisonment, the maximum penalty for espionage. Fuchs was absolutely terrified that he would be either extradited to the United States or that he would face the death penalty. The fact was that the only crime that could really fit the death penalty was treason. And the fact was that the Soviet Union had actually been our ally at that time, had not been a declared enemy, so therefore it couldn't be classed as treason. So he was prosecuted under breaking the Official Secrets Act, which carried a, a prison sentence of 14 years. It was seen as, as a signal event. The Adam spies were, um, were, were basically rounded up. And so if you just take that as, as a sort of culmination of, of American uh, anger and American terror at, at what comes next, uh, I think you can see that, that, that atomic espionage really hit a nerve um, in, in America. She was now implicated in one of the biggest spy scandals of the 20th century, but her escape to East Germany was remarkably unhindered. For all their efforts to monitor and interrogate Sonia over 10 years, could MI5 have actually let her go? They would have more than doubled their efforts, and we can see it in the files now, to try to find every Soviet agent in the network. But at the same time, they were, um, Britain's intelligence services were spectacularly scared of um, telling American authorities too much because they already looked pretty bad, and this was just going to be even worse. Later in life, Sonia even wondered whether there might have been someone in the British establishment protecting them. A number of spies, important spies, like Sonia, at some stage run, basically, are tipped off and they run. It looks as if there is somebody who has inside knowledge who is tipping them off. But who does the tipping off is another major question. And the declassified files in the National Archives even point at who that might have been. One of the, the major clues uh, uh, deals with, um, uh, with, with, uh, with a Soviet agent uh, named Homer. Um, this is a code name for Donald McLean and various, he, one of the, the Cambridge Five who's, uh, who's working um, as, as a first sec secretary at the British Embassy in Washington, D.C. And uh, once that finger is pointed at Donald McLean, ironically, the first person who figures that out is Kim Philby, SIS officer and one of the Cambridge Five, liaison officer in Washington. So Philby warns McLean, and through their friend, another member of the Cambridge spy ring, Guy Burgess. Philby tells Burgess, get McLean out of here, he's, he's got to leave. This is um, correspondence to and from a certain Kim Philby uh, between MI5 and MI6. Um, Kim Philby at the time was a rising star in MI6. Uh, in, in, this is from 1946. 
Um, he was rising up the ranks in MI6's anti-Soviet section. Um, obviously unknown to everyone in MI6 was the fact that he was actually himself a Soviet spy. So here is um, correspondence between MI5 and Philby um, about uh, Sonia. But the, the upshot of all of this for Anglo-American relations is that the, uh, the British have to tell the Americans that, uh, uh, that they have a problem. And because of the, the closeness of the relationship, uh, you know, the, the damage is, is massive. With Sonia and her extended family now safely in East Germany, she decided to retire and spend the rest of her life working in a desk job for the Communist Party, and later as a fiction author. Behind the Iron Curtain, she could only have imagined the chaos left behind in her wake. The Cold War now in ascendance, the extent of the Cambridge spy ring was revealed, with further defections by people in high positions in government and the security services. Journalists, writers, and even former security service staff were clamoring to uncover other moles and agents during the crucial wartime years. And on the American end, the, the CIA's chief of counterintelligence, uh, Jim Angleton, um, you know, so he was friends, uh, close friends with Kim Philby for many years and, and during the, the, the Philby investigation and ultimately his defection, Angleton really sort of you know, goes off the deep end and has a, finds himself lost in a wilderness of mirrors, moles behind every office corridor, um, the careers of, of, of many good, uh, good CIA officers are either called into question, stalled, ruined, um, uh, all because of, uh, of, of, of joint counterintelligence failures. And the final nail in the coffin would come in the form of Britain and America parting ways on their atomic bomb programs. The Brits who were welcomed with open arms uh, as part of Tube Alloys and the, and the Manhattan Project are now unwelcome in American nuclear development. Um, this is an extremely bitter pill for the British to swallow after, um, after the success, really, of the Manhattan Project. In a sense, it worked, and it worked thanks to uh, British uh, expertise, American expertise, and, uh, and, and the greatest scientific minds of the time coming together. But it was Britain's imperial history that would keep them as an important intelligence partner, at least. It took Britain's best efforts to try to um, um, to rebuild its relationship in, in, it, in the, the eyes of, uh, of America, that actually Britain's empire, its, its dwindling imperial holdings across the globe, proved to be a godsend for Britain because Britain had these outposts of empire that were absolutely essential for America's uh, efforts in the Cold War intelligence gathering. A Cold War created largely because both sides were now equipped with the weapons to destroy each other. Would history have taken a different turn if they hadn't have developed this, the, the atomic bomb when they did? Undoubtedly it would have done. If the Soviet Union had, had developed the atomic bomb later, geopolitics of the Cold War would have been very different than they were. Sonia is today a well-known figure in Germany, and her legacy is preserved by a museum and foundation under her pen name, Ruth Werner. But has enough time passed for the country she spied against? to recognize her achievements? We're sitting here from the vantage point of the present uh, and judging people for, the, for their actions 80 years ago uh, when really you know, they are responding to different threats and real threats and, and took a decision and, and stood by it. I think if we look back with the safety of the 21st century and we look at the, the actions of those in the 1930s, those who signed up to the communist causes because they saw it as the, the only real means of fighting against Nazism, you have to at one level sympathise with them, but I don't think that explains or justifies their actions. I think that whatever your um, political affiliations today, whatever you think of communism and the Soviet Union, you've got to admire someone like Sonia for having conducted undercover work for as long as she did. Also coupling that with her family life is quite extraordinary. I might get you on my... The question should be, what motivates people to take actions which they consider to be essential to safeguard their perception of human progress?
when you are really dedicated to the course you have chosen, you really can, at times, tip the scales a little. There's a sort of arrogance that it, that it takes uh, it takes events into one's own hands. This is the sort of you know, Edward Snowden problem. Doing the works you did, giving birth to three children under very odd circumstances, and managing to bring them up, these children, and to, to turn them at least into fairly decent individuals, uh, that's also part of the story. And it is equally magnificent I would say equally important as all the rest of the story that you managed to bring these two things together, which is really incredible.